Welcome to Massive Passive Cash Flow, the podcast that guides professionals to financial prosperity. Join our community and let's start building your wealth. Here's your host, Gary Wilson. Hello, welcome back to the Massive Passive Cash Flow Podcast. I'm Gary Wilson, your host, and I'm glad to have you back on the podcast. If you haven't done so and you wouldn't mind doing so, please go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. It's on 30 different channels, of course, Apple being the biggest one, but you pick the one you like. And while you're out there, please visit globalinvestoragent.com. Get yourself one of the agents that we've trained to work with you and I, the investor. There are 36 states now, up from 25 states this time last year. So it's really growing. And uh, based on what we're seeing, we should have the entire country and parts of Canada cover. Uh, we're already in Ontario, but we're looking at Quebec and uh, BC so uh, for coverage there, too. So, so stay tuned. Pick yourself an agent. And if you are an agent... Boy, I got to tell you guys, you'd be crazy if you don't click on the learn more button and, and learn more about this network because the market is changing. And if you don't have a, a specific program with scripting, methodology, terminology to work with specifically with investors, you're going to be left behind. Plain and simple. We've seen it before. And don't be caught up in that crowd. Be part of the, the, the successful crowd. Click on learn more and learn how you can uh, help others and help yourself too. So in any case, uh, without further ado, we got a great guest today. Uh, Clay Ogden. Clay, thank you very much for joining us. you got a very uh, niche-oriented and important subject, so I'm really excited to get to this podcast. So thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Hey, if you wouldn't mind, a um, uh, little bit of background, you know, wh where are you? How did you get there? And really kind of lead up to where you are today with the, with the A31B, which everybody just hold tight. We're going to explain that. <laughs> and uh, to, take, to take notes, this is a take note podcast. <laughs> so, so uh, Clay, go ahead and get us, get us started if you don't mind, you know? Yeah. So uh, I actually graduated from, from college and I, I started playing professional golf and uh, I met with a lot of different business owners and uh, successful individuals, obviously, that I had met through my, through my golfing career and uh, for something that would allow me to work with those successful individuals, business owners, CEOs, CFOs, etc. And I came across the 831B and loved how this program really allows a business owner to take excess revenues, excess cash flows, set them aside to help them manage more of the uninsurable risks that at the end of the day, they, they're on the hook for anyway. Uh, ironically enough, over the last three, three and a half years, a lot of those things have occurred. And it's really exposed why these programs exist. So, well, I'll tell you what. Let's let's go ahead and dig into to what what is it? What is a A three one B? And then um, we can talk about how you know how we apply it, and then even maybe take some examples because we've got a lot of business owners that follow the podcast, and I think this is going to help a lot of people. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So the A thirty one B is actually a piece of the tax code. It's been around since nineteen eighty six. So it's definitely not new. However, it is new to a lot of people. Um, you know, prior to 07, 08, it was about a quarter quarter million to set one of these up and maintain it. Uh, it was just super costly and very, you know, cost inefficient for a business owner, small to mid market business owner, to really look at this as a planning tool. Uh, over the last 10, 15 years, the costs uh, have really come down. There's obviously been abuses like there is in everything. Uh, but we're starting to kind of hone in on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And really kind of starting to gear towards helping business owners take those excess revenues, excess profits out of their business, mm -hmm. set those dollars aside for the, the supply chain interruptions that we've seen, for the business interruptions that traditional insurance just doesn't cover uh, maybe political risks, political decisions being made that alter someone's business. I mean, it just because it hasn't happened to you yet doesn't mean that it won't happen. I think 2020 opened a lot of people's eyes to the fact that, you know, they were deemed non-essential or forced to close their business. Uh, and I don't think many business owners, if any, ever dreamed that that was capable or possible of happening. And so right. business owners take on a lot of risk. They just do. I mean, that's kind of the name of the game, right? Being able to manage more of those risks that their traditional insurance doesn't cover is what the 831B is designed to do. 
Okay. So. All right, that sounds pretty pretty awesome. I appreciate you bringing up the, the example of the pandemic because you're right. We of all the things. I mean, I'm you know I've been in business for 37 years now, and of all the things you could ever anticipate, I can promise you, a pandemic was not one of them. <laughs> you know. I mean, we were for the first time in history, and it's not the first. It's not the first time we've had a pandemic. I mean, obviously, what they refer to as the Spanish flu way back in the, the second decade of the 1900s, um, pretty dramatic. And I mean, a lot of people on a percentage basis, it was more uh, more costly than this last one that just popped up. But the, the but the point I was trying to make is, is um, we took a different strategy this time. Instead of quarantining all those that were at risk, right? We quarantine everybody else, which is, you know, 97, 98 percent of the people for the sake of the two. I, I'm not disagreeing with I'm just saying that was what changed. And what it meant was all these businesses were just basically shut down. I mean, I, I mean, it was it, it, how do you decide between one and the other? I don't know. I wouldn't want to be in that position. But, you know, I, I saw family businesses in, in business for three or four generations just gone, just wiped out, you know, and you got at Walmart. Open up twenty four seven, selling everything under the sun. But because they sell food and medicine, right? It's it's essential. But next, and they sell candles, by the way. But yet, right next door, the candle stop had to shut down. You know, so there was all those inequities going on. But when you're when when times of crisis, you got to fight the battle, and you clean up. You do battlefield assessment afterwards, and and try to make amends and clean things up. That's what we did. But but this so this really happened. So um, if you're able to. Share like a case study or an example. It doesn't have to be involving the pandemic, but a business yeah. you've helped, or um, I mean, as, as long as you're able to do it and uh, maintain privacy, because I want people to really pay attention to you know why this is like any insurance. It's it's a numbers game. It's all those things. Gee, I wish I didn't have to pay for this, but at the end of the day, when you need it, boy, you're sure glad you have it. <laughs> you know. So, but uh, yeah, any any examples, I, I, case studies come to mind? Yeah, I mean, I, not necessarily. I mean, what we had clients in, involved in the pandemic that had, you know, contractual obligations to, you know, provide product or services by a specific date. Product was either delayed or they didn't ever receive it because the, you know, the the manufacturers and the facilities they were getting the product from had been closed down for two, three, four, six months, and so they were hit with penalties and fees on their contractual obligations. Because of a un, you know a third party interruption, third party interruption is just not covered by traditional insurance because it's outside of the scope of your business. Doesn't matter. I mean, that's something that in, impacted indirectly impacted a lot of business owners. Mm -hmm. uh, supply chain interruptions, cost of building with contractors has gone went through the roof and has since come down to 2014 levels. Uh, we saw a lot of different clients over the last couple of years involved in ice storms down in Dallas mm -hmm. that businesses were really restricted for weeks on end because of the issues going on there. You see it when hurricanes take place in South Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe my business wasn't impacted or devastated or torn apart by the hurricane, but the entire area around me was devastated. And therefore, I'm bound to lose a lot of revenue because of that. Uh, I don't have an insurance claim to file, but I lost a lot of revenue because of an indirect loss. Right. And th those are things that we see fairly regularly, right? I mean, in today's world with uh, cyber attacks, we're starting to see these things more and more. They're becoming more and more frequent. Uh, starting to see things like, you know, uh, starting to see things with social media that ultimately impact the, the way a business runs and someone saying something, whether it was legitimate or not, or taken out of context, they put something on social media or they do something and it gets put on social media, people run with it. And mm -hmm. someone's brand and reputation is questioned or damaged beyond repair. And it's, you know, sometimes it's legit, sometimes it's not, but the damage is already there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are these are a lot of examples that we see with clients pretty regularly mm. that don't fall within traditional insurance, but they are left to manage those losses on their own. Right. Yeah. So you know, it's interesting. We were talking before the podcast about the 
the recent train derailments. I mean, this this is the kind of daytime stamp this podcast, but <laughs> but yeah. there's been several of them in a short period of time, which is really unusual. And the the, the one that's getting in the most press is the one in East Palestine, Ohio. And uh, you know, of course, there's a you know train car after train car of, of chemicals, and there's a whole list of them. They that we you can now are published. You can see what was in there, and the biggest one being the vinyl chloride, of course. But but in any case, when something like that happens, I, what, I guess what I'm getting to is, you know, who, who who's who's covered or who's made whole as a result of A through one B, and also who's the candidate, who's a good candidate for that. In other words, would is Norfolk Southern? I mean, was that a company that would probably have this in, as part of their their strategy? Risk, you know, it basically comes down to risk management. Um, and what you know, what have the people that live there? Um, like you said, a lot of them probably have beauty shops and pet uh, businesses that are uh, unfortunately harmed by this because, you know, they don't know how to operate. Maybe. But I, I guess what I'm getting yeah. at is, is that, a, is that an example, maybe a big example of where this could come into play, you know? Very possible. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the times these programs come into play when, you know, we can look at traditional insurances, but a lot of the times we're looking at the uncommon, unforeseen, uninsurable risks. And oftentimes, if those are excluded in a traditional insurance policy, mm -hmm. no matter what, it's going to fall to the business owner to bear the brunt of. They're just going to, they're either going to eat it, or they're going to find a way to pay for these issues with after-tax money sitting in cash flow, assuming there's excess cash flow at the time of this, you know, unfortunate occurrence. Right. Uh, these programs are really designed to help that business owner in good years, take a little bit of the excess revenues and excess profits, park those to the side in an 831B to now have policies to cover those unforeseen events. When you have excess funds, you have the ability to insure yourself, you know, a little bit more efficiently. When you don't have those, maybe you have contractions in cash flow, you don't have the ability to set dollars aside, then you may not have those excess funds. And, you know, to ensure yourself for those unfortunate, unforeseen events. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's a that's a prime example. There may have been, you know, product that people were anticipating how long it interrupts that rail mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time is, you know, to be determined. Uh, I think there's a lot of a lot of issues that will come from this that we may not see for a couple of years to come. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a that's a that's a toughie. But. So, so now, as far as the IRS code goes, um, you know, the legislation, regulation, all that. So you've got the, so a company can take advantage of the A31B. When they put away some of their excess profits, is that considered an expense? So it's basically, there's a tax benefit to putting the money aside at that time. Is that the, um, one of the benefits of doing this? It is, yeah. So the 831B allows the business owner to take us and set aside up to here in 2023, the number, the ceiling under the 831B is up to 2.65 million. Uh, we will allow up to a percentage of gross revenues, uh, but no more than 2.65 million per 831B. And that's per the 831B tax code. Yeah. So when you ask, you know, who's a, who's a good client, who's a good fit? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we see business owners that do a million gross revenue to hundreds of millions of gross revenue. I would say the vast majority of clients that we work with are a million gross to 50, 60 million gross and everywhere in between, but really designed our program to work with that small to mid market business owner, okay. because these are the types of programs that fortune 500 companies and large enterprises have been using for decades. Uh, but it's now obvious that, the small to mid-market business owner needs these planning tools more than ever uh, because traditional insurance policies continue to add exclusions as right. premiums continue to increase. Yeah. We'll be right back with the Massive Passive Cashflow podcast after I invite you to Monday Night Live. Every Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, I teach a class without fail for you on subjects ranging from flipping to buying rentals, managing rentals, wholesaling, commercial creative purchasing techniques, analyzing properties, identifying properties, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of subjects. And if you are a licensee, if you have a real estate license, you should definitely tap in because 
There are a lot of investor agents also in the class. Many of them are on the, on the uh, global investor agent team. So you can learn from them as well as from me how to actually work with investors correctly and profitably. All right, we'll see you Monday night. The link is in the show notes. Go ahead and register. We'll get right to the, to the Massive Passive Cash Flow Podcast. Yeah, all right. Now, something that just came to mind is there are certain businesses that because of the nature of the product or service, there might be, they're probably at higher risk. And that's not necessarily a, a factor of the size and scope of the business, it's just the nature of the business. So, um, you know, I'll give an example. One of the ones I'm thinking of is I used to own a beauty shop. I didn't have anything to do with their operations. I just owned the, the building okay. and all that business and somebody else did all the work. But, you know, so she's got somebody coming in every 15 minutes, sitting in her chairs with her leaning back, with water on, there's all these potential risk factors. That person would, even though she, he or she might not think they make a lot of money, probably would be a, a, a good candidate for this, for the E through 1B, because they got human beings coming in, they're putting them in different chairs, leaning them back. I mean, I can just think of all kinds of, I've, I've been in business for quite a while. So I've, I've, <laughs> I see this stuff like, like oh my gosh, there's risk here. Um, yeah. But that person versus someone who maybe just has like a, maybe a mail order business running out of the garage where there's no consumer traffic and they're not shipping any, any product they could be can consider uh, risky. However, you know, maybe they get flooded and then their, their garage or basis is flooded and they don't, they can't ship out the product because the product's now damaged. So really, I mean, is there, is there, do you guys group people into or businesses into categories by risk when it comes to approaching them or marketing them or how do you normally yeah, it, it it is by by risk or by policy type. It's not necessarily by industry. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, prime examples we have people that own businesses, you know, that are in the restaurant business or the beauty supply business or manufacturers or distributors. We have clients that do, you know, own a lot of storage units or apartments and townhomes and that kind of thing. We have a lot of you know, contractors, medical professionals, um, they all have uninsurable risks. They just do. I mean, that's, that's what, it's just the fact of the matter. Right. Um, when it comes to, you know, things like business interruption or third party interruption or cyber, poly, you know, we have a growing number of people that we see that, uh, you know, sell products online and they do mm-hmm. do so through Amazon. From time to time, Amazon sees a product that's doing well and selling awesome and they offer it themselves. And that person's eight, 10, 12, $15 million business that they've taken 10 years to build is gone tomorrow morning and there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, But those are, those are real risks, right? I mean, those are things that are, that are starting to become more and more apparent. There's a lot of ways obviously to make money. There's a lot of very successful people, especially with social media in today's world. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the risks aren't necessarily the, you know, more traditional things that we have thought about over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, but there's a lot of, a lot more of the cyber space, um, risks that are becoming a big, big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I, you know, what's interesting is, um, there's now a, a new wave of technology. It's now it's, it's, it's part of everyday conversation, but you know, blockchain processing and Web 3.0. And all, if you think about all the potentialities from that, that, that new software and new technology, um, there's a lot of ramifications. And I, I don't mean, this is just my opinion, but I'm, my opinion is, I think this is going to be impacting you know, human, the human, our human race and the way we conduct business and, and all that in a way that's probably on the same magnitude as like the industrial age, industrial revolution, or even, you know, the technology, you know, computers and information age and all that. It's pretty big. I mean, blockchain itself, I, you know, it's going to, the, the pet store owner is going to be operating off the blockchain, you know? I mean, in real estate, title companies, if you think about a title search, when you're buying a property, they research a chain of title, right? They're basically researching a history of transactions. That's precisely what blockchain processing does, you know, but it's so yeah. much easier and faster and it's accurate and it's almost immutable when it comes to security because if you think how it's designed, you know, the security 
is inherent in the fact that it's decentralized, right? Um, and it involves so many different people and computers. Um, it's just an amazing concept. And, you know, I'm not saying it's perfect. Some, wherever there's, believe me, some criminal somewhere will figure out some way to, to, <laughs> to you know, you know, mess it up a little bit. But, but I think for the most part, it, it's going to have, it is already starting to happen. and we'll continue to have a major change on how we do things. And how does that sure. kind of play out? Is that even part of discussions in, in the folks that you're dealing with? Does that even pop up at all? Um, I mean, not a ton, only because it's such, it's so new, right? It's, it's right. very much an unknown at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, as, as we move forward, as things continue to evolve, inevitably policies that cover new types of risk will come out. Um, we're always looking to expand policies and create new types of risk coverages because things are changing. I mean, they just are, there's, there's constantly new risks that business owners have that they didn't have 15 years ago or that never were even considered. Um, I mean, a lot of these types of policies and things that are covered within these programs, and it's becoming more and more of an issue in today's world is, mm-hmm. is disputes and lawsuits. I mean, disputes and lawsuits come about in any business and every business, no matter what you do. Yeah. You know, when that is when that lawsuit or that legal action is brought against you, are you just using after tax money sitting in cash flow or have you built up a a portion of funds, a, a war chest of funds over here to manage these potential issues if and when they occur. Uh, you know, the industry, I would say the industry that's used these programs the most and done so magnificently efficiently is the auto industry. You know, service contracts, warranties. You look at someone like UPS that offers a shipping protection. You know, mm-hmm. you go mail a package and they sell you. I mean, that's what that's what they're doing here. That's the 831B put into motion in in a perfect way. Um, so that we're just trying to bring that available to various types of risks and different, you know, small to mid market businesses because that's right. that's what this country is running on, and they're taking insane amounts of risk, yeah. but they're not really using the most efficient tools to do so. Yeah, I, I agree. If you think about it, you actually touched on this a moment ago. Um, you know, I guess we call it the, the liability crisis. You know, there's, you know, the, yeah. the sheer volume of litigation that goes on. It's just, I don't even know how, you know, the courts are even keeping, I guess they're not keeping up. They're so far behind, but, but, uh, I mean, that to me is probably one of the most, um, glaring examples of why this is so important because in any day, anybody could file a suit against anybody for any reason. It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. <laughs> that point of filing but it'll tie tie. there there's a term we learned in some business um called enterprise and litigation well people are literally going to court simply to to make money like it's just there's no real basis for their suit but they know because it costs so much money for a company to be to go to court with a lawyer and pay for representation that it's often simpler easier and faster and cheaper just to work to some kind of settlement and that's what happens. So it's a costing money. They're just hoping to reduce the cost of that by not having to go to court and fight somebody. You know, I've been I've been personally involved in that in some of my businesses. And at first, it was extremely frustrating. I looked at my lawyer. I said, "Wait a second, you're telling me <laughs> I'm going to have to to pony up? They're going to pass around the hat, or everybody that's involved." I mean, it was a, a real estate transaction. One of my agents got involved in and her own daughter. By the way, it was her own daughter that sued <laughs> and it, because her mother was the agent. You know, both agents got involved, both brokerages got involved to title companies, the, the, the municipal inspectors. It was everybody. They, they, had, they, they attached everybody they could to the suit. And at the end, the, the lawyers were like, look, you just everybody's got a pony up. I said, wait a minute. This was my own agent, who's the mother of the client that was harmed by this thing. And I got to pay for this. You said, well, either you do, you go to court. It's going to cost you a lot more. And that's what I realized. We we need a we need a way we need a strategy for this and that's so my personal example is exactly what we're just talking about. Like any any example yeah. you think of too, anything has popped up, especially in the last couple of years with the pandemic and you know people harmed by it. Or, but uh, whether they're frivolous lawsuits or not, but but that liability part of it, that to me is you know you know it's and everything else is important and and critical, but that's this probably could be the most costly going to court. You know? Oh yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's honestly probably one of the most utilized policies within our program um, yeah. is to be resolution. I mean, there's we live in an insanely litigious society mm -hmm. and people bring legal action, as you just said, for any and all reasons. Yeah. Um, sometimes legitimate, sometimes just to tie people up. And it's it's something that happens all the time. Obviously, different states have a much more um, common issue with it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a growing, it's a growing concern. It's a growing issue. It's been there for a long time, but it is becoming more and more of a problem. Uh, some of the, some of the other risks that we've seen actually is people wiring money or receiving a spoof email where it looks exactly like an invoice that they were anticipating. Okay. An employee receives it, they pay it, they uh, send the money. And we've had a couple of cases where it's been, you know, 80 something thousand dollars wired to a black hole and a couple hundred thousand dollars wired to a black hole. And that luckily these clients have set funds aside and they've helped manage their own risk a little bit. But nonetheless, I mean, that's a that's a massive problem. And it's, oh, yeah. you know, it's it's a it's one letter that's different or maybe, you know, everything looks identical, but it's there's a phrase in the email or something that's changed just fractionally. Right. Unless you're paying crazy close attention, you don't notice it. You click the link, you pay it, and it's gone. Yeah, uh, it's it's something we've seen a handful of times, and it's 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 a it's a heart wrenching one when it happens. So yeah, I mean the litigi the litigious thing is becoming it's it's not going away anytime soon. I don't think that we've begin to see or begun to see the issues that COVID has had right. and the lawsuits that might stem from that. Yeah. Yeah, that that's I, that is pretty scary. I mean, I've, I've I've I know that that happens too. It hasn't happened to me personally, but I know people personally that that's happened to. And uh, it's as it's as scary and and um, you know, anger inducing is is like identity theft. You know, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I mean, I I have actually I've worked with a lot of advisors, CPAs, tax advisors. You know. PNC agents, anyone who works with business owners is really who we work with, mm -hmm. um, as well as the end using business owner. And a lot of a lot of comments have been made over the last couple of years that kind of the cybersecurity dispute, re you know, uh, data breach type stuff mm -hmm. is becoming more of that personal identity theft. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. So now, is there anybody um, that you think would, it's a uh, would not be a candidate. I mean, in terms of business owners, it seems to me like the, that last one, the liability risk, I don't care what business you're in, what product or service you have, the, 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 because litigation can pop up anywhere, anytime, you have to have a defensive plan. You got to play. It's, you know, we're, most entrepreneurs are focusing on offense, especially in the beginning years. They're not thinking defense. That doesn't come about until maybe something happens to them. They give a wake up call. Actually, let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, um, what, you know, you know how it is starting a business. It's hard. I mean, you're trying to like, just get some cash flow coming in the beginning, but when should somebody really consider this? You know? Um, I mean, really any business owner that has, I would say 75 to a hundred thousand dollars in excess cash flow and more to set aside is really someone that should be looking at this, right? If the, if, if until you can meet those kind of basic parameters, I would say it's probably something that absolutely every business owner should look at, but in order for it to pencil and make sense, that's kind of where that line in the sand would be. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, typically these programs are very cost prohibitive for that small to mid-market business owner. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a lot of different stuff as far as cost structure goes to bring it down to that small to mid-market business owner. Um, but still, you know, there's, there's a cost to doing business. And I would say that probably that 75 to a hundred thousand dollars a year mark is where I would say is kind of the, the net positive for a business owner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, now, how, so, how can people learn more about this? I mean, I, I know, any way we can get a hold of you, you know, website, email, special report, uh, anything you can provide that would be yeah. real. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So our website is SRA. Three one B. Or our, our, I guess our website is www.831b.com. Uh, people can always reach me at clay at 831b.com. 
uh, and then happy to provide a cell phone number if people want to just call or text uh, as well. I mean, that's it's shocking to me how many people prefer to just call and text. Uh, I mean, I work that way, but a lot of a lot of business yeah. owners prefer that. So, yeah. So it's clay g l a y at eight three one b dot com. Yes. Email. Okay. That's yep. usually the most common. But if you want to, you want to rattle off your phone number. You're sure, you want to do that. I mean, I, we we I do that too. By the way, you know. Yeah. So. I mean, my 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 number is eight zero one five eight nine two zero. What was the last four digits? Four four two zero. Okay. All right. Yeah. And 881 is a, the area code? 801. 801, I'm sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. All right. 589-4420. Okay. Yeah. So everybody listening, uh, if you've got a business, at least have the conversation. Um, I'm telling you from personal experience, I've been down that road before thinking everything's fine. And um, some weird quirky thing pops up. And like in my case, it was the, the daughter of one of my agents and you know, the daughter bought what she thought was a, thri a triplex and he had it inspected everything from the city, the municipality, all everything was done. And then three months later, she goes to do some remodeling. The inspector comes back out and says, gee, this actually is only zoned for a duplex. You can't even have this third unit. You got to you got to take out the kitchen and blah, blah, blah. And we were crazy. So wait a second. You inspected it. You passed it as a three unit. But it didn't matter. The code was the code. And the city inspector was pretty much um, um, protected, I guess, from his employment. And, and it involved other the, both brokerages, the title company. Um, you'd be amazed how many people got dragged into the thing. And, you know, the, <laughs> for me to have to, to give money to my agent's daughter, and I know my age, agent was probably not giving money to her daughter. I'm sure her daughter said, oh, that's okay, mom, you don't, you don't need your money. But the rest of us had to pay. You know, and I didn't, nothing covered it. That came right out of pocket and that came right, wow. off, right off the top. So, so keep that in mind, guys. I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter how big or small your business is. If you got, like Clay suggested, maybe 75K in excess, um, you may want to seriously consider this because the way the world works is the more you have, the more target you become and you got to protect yourself. And this is one surefire way to do it. So Clay, any, any final uh, words of wisdom you want to share with anybody before we take off here? You know, I, I, I definitely see this more and more um, in a lot of the business owners we work with in all sizes. It, it is becoming more and more frequent. It is becoming definitely something more and more people are becoming familiar with. Again, whether it's a fit for your business right now or ever, it's absolutely something that should be looked at because simply from a risk management tool and a efficiency, tax efficiency tool, uh, it brings a lot to the table. Uh, is it a fit for everybody? Absolutely not. Should it be looked at for most business owners? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think it should be looked at part of an annual plan. We have a, we, we do strategic planning. I mean, we do it regularly throughout the year, but we do an annual one in December and everybody, we, we take a big chunk of time. We all get together and get out yeah. the boards and, and, uh, and I've, I've learned over the years, you got to You've got to just like in a, any sports game, any football, you know, you don't just play offense. You got to play defense too, <laughs> you know? And, uh, 100%. So, yeah. Same thing in business, guys. Same thing in business, you know? Um, so so be a good custodian. Be responsible for what God gave you and uh, make this part of your plan. Um, well, Clay, thanks again. for And for everybody listening, thank you for participating. And if you could, if you wouldn't mind, please go ahead and leave a, a good review for this one and reach out to Clay. Again, uh, Clay at 831B.com. Number is 801 five eight nine four four two zero and while you're out there go go ahead and go to globalinvestoration.com click on learn more and see how you can uh participate in the real estate investing game with your clients and or yourself particularly if you're a licensed real estate agent this is one of the most critical times we don't know how crazy this is going to get but the numbers don't lie you know this is the time to not panic it's time to prepare and uh, do play some defense for yourself too and click on that learn more button. Okay, we'll see you on the next Massive Passive Cash Loop podcast. Take care, guys.
Thanks, sir. Thanks for listening to this episode of Massive Passive Cash Flow. Be sure to go to realestatewithgarywilson.com to join our community and start building wealth today.